Miles Morales pulls off the same exact move that he admired seeing in his hero Peter Parker, but with a lot more crap flying at him and landing in an even cooler pose. Across the multiverse, our commonalities unite us, but the hundreds of tiny details that make our homes unique are what truly define our realities. And in this video, I'm gonna try to cover all of them. I'm Eric Voss, and this is The Deep Dive. In 2018, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse is my favorite Spider-Man film and one of my favorite superhero films of all time. With its sequel coming this week, we are long overdue revisiting this movie because there are no joke hundreds of animation details I never caught until my recent watches. And the best way to support The Deep Dive is with a Miles Morales Multiverse Dive shirt available at nerdriot.shop. So listen closely to the opening seconds of the movie. Yeah, that was a cough. Producers Phil Lord and Chris Miller included a cough in the opening titles of their previous film, 2014's 22 Jump Street, so they did it here too. And as we push it on Sony, we see Ben Day dots. These are the dots that are used to print colors in comic books, as this whole movie is animated with the aesthetic of a comic book page. Literally, you could pause this movie at any frame, kind of like when you leave a comic book open on your bed, and when you come back to it, you just happen to notice something different about a particular panel. And so that if you take your time to really go through a comic book, you will always see some crisp new detail popping out at you. When you watch this, this movie, these details feel so good to discover because what makes something feel like home in our worlds is like comfort food. It's in the details and the specificity of it, a notch on a wall or a particular smell of a room. So in this movie, like Miles sniffing the steam and that little smile he gives tasting his mother's cooking or Peter B. Parker getting burger grease on us, that is what home is. So throughout this video, I'm gonna single out these new comfort food details that I find, things that never get talked about in other Easter egg videos. Now the Torchbearer Columbia logo glitches into an animated cowgirl. This is from the 1965 Jane Fonda film Cat Baloo, which also happens to the Columbia logo in that movie. But the Torchbearer also gets hit with a giant banana, which also happens in the opening Columbia logo of Lord and Miller's Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. As much as we are in a Spider-Verse, we're also in a Lord and Miller-verse. Now, after the studio logos is this stamp approved by the Comics Code Authority. This was a set of guidelines for comics from the 1950s to assure parents that a comic wouldn't corrupt their kids' minds, including anything that would promote sympathy for a criminal or glamorizing crime. This movie actually follows the guidelines. The criminals Wilson Fisk and Aaron Davis all suffer and get punished for their crimes. We see the Alchemex spider numbered 42 in the eye of the multiverse collider. This is the moment it gets infected. 42, of course, is Miles' number. It's also on the lottery ball. This is for Miles being selected for the Brooklyn Visions Academy and on the cluttered numbers on the ground later. 42 is the spider's number in the Ultimate Comics, Jackie Robinson's number, and in Hitchhiker's Guide, the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. The Peter Parker of this universe, 1610, is voiced by Chris Pine, and he says, All right, let's do this one last time which every Spider person says whenever they introduce themselves in this movie. On the cover of the comic book is a signature of M. Vignali, for Marcel Vignali, an artist who worked on this movie, but for every character, the cover names tend to be the creators of that character. For Miles, later in the movie, we see it's Brian Michael Bendis and Sarah Pacelli. For Spider-Gwen, it's Jason Latour and Robbie Rodriguez. Peter swings through this alternate New York with its Coca Soda sign, as well as the New York Red Sox and back rub. That was actually the original name for Google before they changed it to Google. Later on, we see Red X instead of FedEx. And when Peter says for 10 years, he's been the one and only Spider-Man. On the cityscape behind him is a neon sign, wrong, because in a multiverse, you're not the one and only Spider-Man. Uncle Ben says the big line, With great power comes great responsibility. Lord says they actually use Cliff Robertson's actual audio from the 2002 film. With great power comes great responsibility. We see Peter stopping the train just like Toby Peter does in Spider-Man 2. There's an upside down kiss like in the 2002 film, but since it's 1610, MJ is the one hanging upside down. Peter senses the car being thrown at him like Peter does when Doc Ock throws the car at him and MJ in Spider-Man 2. And then he does the classic finger guns and dancing that Toby does in Spider-Man 3. Peter then shows this deformed popsicle. I mean, I've looked worse. Yeah, his bulging eyes when he's choked look just like the droopy eyes of the popsicle. Also notice the Doc Ock arm is a different texture foreshadowing that this universe's Doc Ock is different. Miles sings Post Malone's Sunflower. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. Miles taps that highlighter on his throat with the impact lines on the tap, showing how he's trying to hit the high note. Now there is a metal hanging on this banner in a way that many say looks like Deadpool or the Prowler. I don't think this is an Easter egg. I think it's just a metal on a banner. But then Miles passes this post. His height chart shows his past height at age 10 with lots of lines of past measurements, but how after that he stopped getting measured as often because he's a cool teenager. Yeah. Ooh. This also sets up Miles' symbolic growth spurt in this movie, growing into the role of Spider-Man. And yes, that smile Miles gives upon smelling the steam of his mom's rice, it's just so so authentic. The animators made 1610 a home we would die to protect. One of the neighborhood kids asks, Yo, Miles, you that earthquake last night? Yes, earthquake, Ananda Fisk's underground collider experiments. Miles trips on his own shoelaces since it's his choice to leave them untied. Yeah, I'm aware. It's a choice. 
which later causes him to trip over the ledge and break the thumb drive. Only during his heroic jump do we see that he finally ties his shoes. His dad pulls up in a cop car with the plate RFD 960, which is the plate of the detective's car in Law & Order. Jefferson points to the long line of the new foam party coffee shop, which Miles in the spot literally have a foam party in in the sequel. There's a news report about the earthquakes with ticker texts. Bitcoin hits new high with intro to futures market. Later during the report of Peter's death, the report is Bitcoin hits new high, and then immediately Bitcoin hits new low. Other ticker text reads largest baby board today, which is ridiculous. Now, this is a really nerdy font detail, but the subway signs are all in the Arial typeface. In New York in real life, they're in Helvetica. But in 1992, Arial was introduced by Microsoft as an alternative to Helvetica. Miles' dad says, You know, with great ability comes great accountability. That's not even how the saying goes. Yeah, Uncle Ben's words obviously immortalized to the regular folks of this world. And when he drops Miles off, a taxi passes with the ad, George Saunders, Custard Purgatory, put some mustard in your custard, which the co-director said is a book that doesn't exist, but they asked the author Saunders for the name of a book that he would write in an alternate universe. Miles' English teacher assigns Charles Dickens great expectations. Now notice the cover features characters embracing in a cemetery, just like Miles will do when he meets Peter B. Parker later. But thematically, this inspires Miles' no expectations wall art, his defiance to the expectations set for him by his parents and teachers. Miles interrupts a video projecting Alchemex head scientist Dr. Olivia O, oh, and it's cut off to hide the reveal, but we'll later learn that is Octavius. A little clue here, her glasses lenses are octagon shaped. Miles' test comes back zero out of 100. It's a true or false test, meaning Miles must have known the right answers to get them all wrong. But notice at the top he wrote December 2nd, showing how he's trying way too hard to look stupid. In Miles' dorm room, he has a poster of Chance the Rapper who wears a number four hat in this universe instead of a number three hat. The painting in Aaron's apartment shows a predator cat. And if you look closely at those skewed words, that is the word prowler. Aaron also wears a t-shirt with the panther on it, Brooklyn Muay Thai Club. But the wallpaper of Aaron's phone shows his brother Jefferson giving him a noogie. Later, we see the background of Jefferson's phone. It's a photo of the brothers older and further apart. So Jefferson looks at the relationship of when they drifted apart. Aaron just remembers the good old days. But that photo on Jefferson's phone is actually framed in Aaron's apartment if you look closely. Ooh, I just love it when artists put these little details in there to convey how these characters feel about each other. On Aaron's TV, he watches the episode of Community where Donald Glover as Troy wears Spider-Man pajamas. Donald Glover voiced Miles Morales in the Ultimate Animated Series. There was a campaign for him to play Miles in live action, but he does play Aaron Davis in live action in the MCU in Spider-Man Homecoming. Now the passing subway transition includes a brief passing cameo of Stan Lee. As Miles paints, the Alchemax spider hops from can to can and notice how it blends in with the color, foretelling Miles' cloaking ability. His wall art is complete with Aaron painting Miles' silhouette over the words no expectations, creating an image that actually recalls the spot and across the Spider-Verse. But when the spider bites Miles, it releases blue bolts of electricity that go down through his skin tissue and then reaching his capillaries and bloodstream, showing how electricity will also be part of his power set. Miles grows out of his clothes and starts thinking in yellow text boxes, and then when he first stumbles through school, you can actually see Gwen's feet behind him. We later see her point of view of the same moment when we catch up with her. Miles tries to apply Aaron's shoulder move, but he sticks to Gwen's hair. Oh, oh. Let go. A dance fight. Ooh. I'd mentioned my MCU theory of dancers versus non-dancers, like with Loki and Sylvie. Some people just become dancers when they bump into their alternate selves. The animated Spider-Verse is separate from the MCU, but it's just interesting to see this theme apply here too. Miles runs into the security guard's office by mistake and slaps his laptop. Spider bells, goblin spells. Yeah, the guard had been listening to the Christmas album that we saw earlier, and Chris Pine himself does the vocals here. While Miles sticks to the wall outside, a flock of pigeons fly past Miles, the two stick to him. Pigeons flew past Peter Parker, earlier too, if you remember, but he looks super cool and smooth. The classroom Miles passes as a hang in there, kitty poster, like it's encouraging Miles. And then when he lands back in his room, we see Amazing Fantasy number 15. This is the first comic appearance of Spider-Man, but notice the cover has been changed to the true life tales of Spider-Man. He's carrying a different guy, and his name in these comics is not Peter Parker, it's Billy Barker, since Peter's identity in 1610 would still be a secret. On Miles' phone are contacts Cindy M for Cindy Moon, aka Silk from the Marvel Comics, Jessica Drew, Spider-Woman, an alt-universe version of Spider-Man, that we'll meet in Across the Spider-Verse. And flanking mom and dad on the list are B. Bendis and Sarah Pacelli. For Brian Michael Bendis and Sarah Pacelli, the two creators of Miles Morales, arguably his parents. Jason Reynolds is also on the screen. He's the author of a Miles Morales YA novel. Now, I love how Miles' spider sense lures him into Peter's battle with Green Goblin. In the Spider-Verse comics, this is called Arachno Frequency, and it's a kind of multiversal cosmic force that all spider people are linked to. So really, this sense is what guided Miles here. That initial look out is colored red and blue, and when Miles and Peter come face to face, Face, Miles' spider sense gives Peter a red and blue aura, while Peter initially sees Miles with a green and purple aura. Those are goblins' colors, a threat. But then seconds go by and it transitions to save red and blue, a Spider-Man just like me. Wilson Fisk's screen shows the six linked dimensions, 1610 at the center, then E616, E65, E90412, E14512, 
and E8311. Those are all the exact universal designations for all these characters. 6010 is for Miles Morales, 616 Peter B. Parker, 65 for Spider Gwen, 90412 for Spider Man Noir, 14512 for Penny Parker, and 8311 for Spider Ham Peter Porker. We see flashes of some of these when Goblin shoves Peter's head into that beam, which looks a lot like inky Ben Day dots. Like the very fabric of this existence is the ink of a comic book. And when the collider explodes in that shockwave, you can see the five other Spider People blasting across the city. Peter tells Kingpin his family's gone, and Kingpin, in rage, slams both of his fists on him. This exact move is a visual reference to the Daredevil Gang War comic. This was the storyline that reinvented Kingpin into the rage monster we know him as. And notice how they also added a bit of drool on Kingpin's scream to underscore his savagery. Prowler chases Miles through the subway. The reverse of the route these two took to get down here initially, we see smoke billowing up from Prowler's muffler, and it's steam that Miles hides in from that vent pipe. He passes that residual glitching pile. Yeah, I think it's a Banksy. This Brooklyn bystander is confirmed in the credits to be a vocal cameo by Post Malone. Miles buys a Spider-Man costume from Stan Lee. Can I return it if it doesn't fit? It always fits, eventually setting up Miles' metaphorical growth into the Spider-Man suit in this movie. Miles attempts a jump test, first a building with a stairwell you cannot see the bottom of, then a shorter one with a visible ground floor. After breaking the thumb drive, Miles visits Peter's grave, and there is a Daily Bugle newspaper. Spider-Man dead, Peter Parker 27, kept New York safe for years, found dead in front of Daily Bugle. Of course, they work in the Daily Bugle into the story, but Peter B. Parker sneaks up behind him and Miles electrocutes him. We see Peter B. Parker's nervous system, not his skeleton, his nervous system electrifies, which is more realistic. And yeah, those nerve endings down there. Well, and across the Spider-Verse, Mayday Parker has to come from somewhere. So, hmm. Geology is a 22-time award-winning skin, hair, and body care company recognized in Men's Health, Oprah Daily, Hype Beast, Birdie, Esquire, and GQ. Their products are built around just a handful of powerful, proven ingredients that have been trusted by dermatologists for decades. Just take a quick 30-second diagnostic quiz, and Geology will create a simple and effective skincare or hair care routine customized just for you. Geology's co-wash and their deodorant are just so great, and I use them all the time. But right now, they're offering a special offer for a skincare sampler pack, and Geology skincare stuff is in a league of its own. Geology's line of skincare products can help you fight acne, reduce oiliness, prevent wrinkles, combat dark or puffy under eyes, have smoother, hydrated skin, and target signs of aging. There's never been a better time to try Geology than right now. For a limited time, use code ROCKSTARS100 to get 100% off your personalized 30-day skincare sampler set. All you have to cover is the $4.95 for shipping. What a deal! On top of that, new Rockstar fans get an exclusive bonus offer of up to 50% off on an additional skin, hair, and body product of your choice when you add it to your trial. Click the link in the description or go to G-E-O-L-O-G dot I-E slash Rockstars100 to get started. Peter B. Parker introduces himself with a name tag that, when you compare it to the 1610 Peter Parker, this one is way more worn and dirty since 616 Peter has been at it for 12 years longer. This Peter had the normal upside down kiss with MJ and he gets hit with a bus. This one is actually driven by Tombstone. He reads a negative review in the Bugle of his TGI Spidey's restaurant. And when Peter B. Parker gets sucked into the rift, he webs his mask and he tries to whip a slice of pizza, but it doesn't make it through. Now, the 1610 Times Square are signs filled with alternate universe details. A movie billboard for From Dusk Till Shawn, which is a nod to the movie Shaun of the Dead. This is actually Edgar Wright's title idea for a Shaun of the Dead sequel with vampires, like From Dusk Till Dawn. A Seth Rogen movie called Hold Your Horses. A show called Clone College, which is a fictional spinoff to the animated series Clone High. Lord and Miller's animated series that just got rebooted. A sign for the Broadway show called Hi Hello, starring Nick Kroll and John Mulaney, a nod to their real life show Oh Hello. Pickaboo, that was the original name for Snapchat. Kitten Heels the Musical, a take on Kinky Boots. Critics call it perfect. New York Red Sox player Blake Griffin. In this universe, he plays baseball. Planet Inglewood instead of Planet Hollywood. Baby Showers, that looks like the cast of Bridesmaids. Red Man Group instead of Blue Man Group. A sign for The Mary Janes, that's the name of Gwen Stacy's band of the comics. Kissland, an alternate universe of the Weekend Starboy album cover, Golden Boy Steph Curry, a golfer in this reality, Romita Ramen, a nod to Spider-Man artist John Romita Sr., Il Giornale Coffee, that's the name of the coffee company Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz created in 1983 after he left Starbucks, Beefsteak Charlie's, that's a restaurant that closed down in the late aughts, and Mr. Tomato Head instead of Mr. Potato Head. The way Peter peels off the column is just like a slice of pizza. Peter repeatedly wakes up during this, but whenever he does, Miles immediately just slams his face into a tombstone or the pavement or a traffic light to knock him out again. At one point, the traffic cone they knock up lands on Peter's head 
like a hat. As the snowman head smears across the bus window, the stick starts as a smile and gradually becomes a frown. As they lie on the crosswalk, Stan Lee makes another cameo, stepping over them. As Miles interrogates Peter, his face starts bruised up from the past escape, but right after this, outside on the side of the building, his face is very quickly healed, showing Peter's rapid healing ability at work. So when Peter bites into the burger, he squirts grease on the camera. It's just another example of the animators using the savoring of taste to make us feel like home. Because Peter says here, In my universe, this place closed six years ago. Yeah, remember Peter was glitching in the previous scene, so this little taste of home, this comfort food, mm, it calmed his nerves and it saved him here. And yes, I do love the C grade on the door. Now on the bus ride to Alchemex in Hudson Valley, the max occupancy is 42, another nod to Miles' number. So they break into the Alchemex lab and I think my favorite animation gag comes right here. Ah! Did you catch it? For a single frame, as Miles falls, his eyes pop out of his head. This is called a smear frame in animation, when animators will cheat our eyes by distorting the body to create this motion blur effect. There are several creepy ones that you can find from The Simpsons. Now, throughout Olivia's lab, everything is octagon shaped. The lights, the hand sensors on the door, the buckle on the seat harness, the tiles on the floor. Also, yes, as they fall into the room, the bubble claw is right there on the table, and an old school metallic one is on the shelf. Olivia's cluttered computer desktop contains a number of folders named Ock Notes. You can also see a folder Bust Sandwiches. Now, it probably meant to say Best Sandwiches, but I don't know, maybe something dirty? And Olivia reveals herself. Can I assume that your friends call you Doc Ock? My friends actually call me Liv. Now later, when Aunt May sees her, she says, Oh great, it's Liv. So they might have a friendship. I mean, Doc Ock and Aunt May do kind of hook up in the comics. So when Miles throws the bagel, we see the word bagel. But a new animation detail I just noticed. When all the other Alchemex scientists stand up to confront Peter and Miles in the cafeteria, there is one female scientist who had been dumping sugar in her coffee and now looks up tired and just goes back to her coffee. No f given. Again, our comfort food is what gives our reality meaning. As Miles and Peter swing through the trees, this is the clearest distinction of the animators animating in twos for Miles' movement. See, most animation animates in ones, which means a new cell for every frame of film, 24 frames per second. But for Miles, the animators in this movie went back to old school animation, 12 frames per second, or which every frame is repeated twice, which ends up with the movement looking choppy. Meanwhile, Peter's swinging is animated in ones, so he looks a lot smoother, all to contrast Miles' staggered clumsy swinging. So they use animation technology and animation history to show Miles' awkwardness and his hesitation versus Peter's confidence and experience. Now Gwen shows up to save them with her teal ballet slippers, which she had been wearing with black tights under her school uniform earlier, meaning her spider suit was in plain sight. They end up meeting up with Aunt May in Queens, and I like how it says somewhere in Queens because this is all from Miles' perspective. He's from Brooklyn, he doesn't know Queens. She takes him down in the spider cave, they pass this weight bench, 250 pound dumbbells there. Others weighing a whole ton, which Peter beneath because he has super strength. They pass the spider mobile, and then down on the floor, 12 suit containers. From the left, there's an all red one, and then one with this white logo. This is the advanced suit from the PS4 game, then the Electroproof suit, and then Peter's classic suit, then the Secret War suit, not Secret Wars, Secret War suit, then an all black suit, then this caped suit, which is actually a nod to the What If number 19, where Spider Man becomes a celebrity, then the green lined big time stealth suit, then one with a royal blue chest, then the Spider Armor Mark 1, followed by the yellow lined Spider Armor Mark 2, and then this last one, a red and gold one, the Iron Spider suit from the comics. And when Miles looks up at Peter's normal suit, his reflected face doesn't yet reach the head, but as Stan Lee says, they all fit eventually. And when Miles is ready in this movie, his face aligns later. Gwen checks out Kingpin's network. Now there are actually a bunch of Marvel villains here that are not featured in this movie. On the left above Tombstone is the Enforcers from the Marvel comics, and then Hammerhead in his mugshot. And then on the lower right is an interesting one, the Rose. This is a villain persona that was originally held in the comics by Kingpin's son, Richard Fisk, who appears in this movie as a kid. Then the three other spider people arrive, and Peter and Gwen's spider senses go off a half second before Miles' does, showing that he's still a step behind them. We meet Spider-Man Noir, Penny Parker, and Spider-Ham, and all of their spider senses go off together as they recognize each other, including an additional one from the robot from that psychic spider inside. And when their comic books slap down, the prices are all period accurate, like Spider-Man Noir, five cents as it would have been in the 30s and 40s, Spider-Ham is 75 cents as it would have been in the 1980s, 
There's a brief shot when Penny hugs the robot and its eyes turn into hearts with the Japanese characters for I love you. But Miles fails to exhibit his cloaking and his electrocution powers and he takes a beating from the others. Gwen grabs his hand to pull him to his feet and for a single frame you can see Miles smiling, very smitten, but she just does this to kick him back down. But Miles finally does manage to turn invisible but to leave, showing that the biggest threat to him in this moment, what triggers this, is his rejection from the other spider people. Just important to remember heading into Across the Spider-Verse, these variants aren't always what's best for Miles. Miles passes Bendis used books from Brian Michael Bendis and Romita Raman, again for John Romita Sr., and even more artists show up in Miles' dad's phone contacts, D. Cowan for comic artist Dennis Cowan, C. McKenna for Chris McKenna, screenwriter who co-wrote Far From Home and No Way Home, T. McFarlane for Todd McFarlane, a Spider-Man artist and co-creator of Image Comics, and at the bottom, Spider-Man co-creator Steve Ditko. As Prowler chases Miles through the streets, he hits a taxi with an ad for this book, Babylon Blood Cloth, a fictional title from real-life author Marlon James, and the review says this book is full of good stuff, book review. They also pass a USB truck instead of UPS, but its slogan on the side is, get it there, maybe? Penny repairs the Goober thumb drive, and she does it all in Japanese so that later when it activates on the control panel, it is Japanese as well. It's said as Particle Collider. Kingpin's goons fight them in Aunt May's living room, and during the melee, you can briefly see Spider-Ham throwing a toilet bowl on Tombstone's head. This fight ends with Aaron sparing Miles, but he gets shot by Kingpin, leading Miles back to his dorm room, where in the foreground, you can see that Great Expectations book taunting him. There's also a Daily Bugle in here that I just noticed, this idiotic headline, Sunsets, how do they work? Making me think that the J. Jonah Jameson in this universe is a flat earther. His roommate reads a Marvel Imagine That comic, a reference to the real life What If series. When they scramble around the ceiling, Spider-Ham's legs make a Looney Tunes style smear frame. So after webbing up Miles so he can't come with them, the others swing off, whipping their webbing to nothing in the sky above them, which might be a reference to the PS2 Spider-Man game where you just got a webbed open sky, or should we say a bunch of helicopters off screen. Miles' dad tells him through the door, I see this, this spark in you, it, it's amazing. Yes, Jefferson came over here to tell Miles that his uncle Aaron died, but he just takes this moment to encourage his son. And I like the split framing here, it sets up the phone call that they have at the end of the movie that Miles cuts off just so he can find his dad and hug him. But this is an important line, I see the spark inside you because it is a spark that Miles uses to blast out of this webbing, leading Miles to his big leap of faith moment. And notice how his hands break the glass off the building. Throughout this movie, he always clings to stuff when he's nervous. So he's freaked out here, yet he's still forced himself in that window with his strength to overcome the fear. And I think my favorite shot of this movie is Miles making this deep dive, but they frame him upside down to make this leap of faith look like a triumphant rise to the challenge. Because folks, that is what all deep dives are really. They are climbs! Run! Climb! Miles swings on the same flagpole that he hit before for the Manderville Hotel, but now the flag is taken down, maybe because he damaged it before. But back then, Miles falling, ah, followed him down. Now his victorious woo! follows him up. The others peer in at Fisk's banquet, and you can see Penny's robot's eyes flash, Japanese for I'm scared. And as they all swing up to the glider, a little animation detail I like about Spider-Man Noir, he often whips with one hand and then he grabs that web string with the other hand, kind of like a rope that he grapples onto to make a stronger swing. So in this big fight, Olivia slings tiles at them and Peter and Miles finally whip in sync, both of them smoothly in 24 frames per second. Miles has finally evolved out of that 12 frame per second staggered animation in twos. The collider explodes with random random crap from other dimensions, Miles plows through a snowman, just like the one they beheaded earlier. Then Miles passes the Flintsmurfer. This is the Flintlockwood Diatonic Super Mutating Dynamic Food Replicator from Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. Again, this is not just a Spider-Verse, it's a Lord and Miller-verse. Spider-Man Noir shoves his hat onto Tombstone's face and punches him, making the old-timey word applesauce. And then he whips a 1930s Model T car to slam it down on him. But my favorite combination in this movie, Miles catches Gwen, he whips up to Peter, but Peter grabs that strand and then slingshots the the two of them upward, but he still hangs on. Why? Well, to pull Miles down precisely as Miles throws Gwen upward to create a maximum whiplash so that Gwen will zip upward with maximum momentum at Olivia, wham, followed by Miles with a punch, followed by Peter with a roundhouse kick, and then Gwen and Miles with a synced punch that emits the word bye. Then one of my favorite new details here, Miles begins his triumphant callback maneuver that I mentioned at the beginning of this video, that move that he learned directly from the 1610 Peter. But to start this, he whips onto an object. What is that? 
That is Aaron's record player, a memento of arguably his most important mentor figure, giving him the initial boost here. Mmm, just a great detail. So all the others return home through the rift, and Miles forces Peter B. Parker to go home by doing the same sweep the leg move that Peter had done on him to force him to sit out the fight. As I said before, across the multiverse, our commonalities unite us, but we must also celebrate our differences, and Miles has to fight Kingpin his own way to claim to be the Spider-Man of his home universe. During this fight, Kingpin's son flickers into the suit and red-tinted sunglasses of Matt Murdock, Fisk's other primary foe from the Hell's Kitchen. We also see the Brooklyn Bridge lit red, just like the Netflix Daredevil opening credits. But Miles' finishing move on Kingpin is something all his own that none of the other Spider-Men taught him, a move that he learned from his uncle Aaron. You ever hear of the shoulder touch? What? Hey. Bring us to the closing montage. Miles finishes his essay and covers it with his no expectations art changed to great expectations because like Pip and Charles Dickens story, he may not have gotten his Estella, Gwen, but he did come of age. I gotta point this out because it's such a good comfort food detail. We briefly see Spider-Ham eating a hot dog with a ton of puns all over the place. With great fryers comes great hospitality. The original Porca-Cola, gross. We relish your business. And my favorite, recession special, $800. And Miles' final run, he passes a sign, Perry Joe. This is for Joe Perry from Aerosmith, who performed the theme song for the 90s animated series. But one final yummy detail. Frames before this on the train, one final Stan Lee cameo. And yes, I have seen this before, but only now, after seeing this movie over a dozen times, only now did I realize Stan is making the web slinger pose. This is a pose that the guy loved to make. And Stan was right. The suit always does fit eventually. Now the post credit scene will tease the incoming Spider-Man 2099, Miguel O'Hara, but I love that this film just kind of ends with Miles back in his bedroom listening to Sunflower. But this time he doesn't sing along because he doesn't know the words. He just listens and enjoys it in a multiverse of infinite realities. Home is wherever we can find our simple pleasures. And this brings us to an end of our first reality month here on The Deep Dive. But hey, I'm gonna be hosting a live stream breakdown of Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse on Friday, June 2nd at noon Eastern. So join me for that and celebrate this moment with a Miles Morales multiverse dive shirt at nerdriot.shop. Subscribe to The Deep Dive, turn notifications on, share this channel and its videos with everyone you know. Follow me at EA Voss. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time, my divers of the deep.